Thank you, President LeDuc. I am touched by your kind words. I will say that maybe it's a good thing you don't remember what I stood out for. <laughs> I could have gotten in a little trouble while I was at Cooley. But let me get to the reason I'm here today. I want to welcome everybody who's here and, and start off by saying congratulations, graduates. This is a momentous occasion. I have to tell you that when President LeDuc asked me to speak here today, I was honored, I was flattered, and quite honestly, I was stunned and maybe a little bit panicked. And I'll tell you something, if I had known I had to go after Kiona, I wouldn't have accepted. <laughs> She's fabulous, really nice job. I expect that had our phone call been recorded, you probably would have heard several seconds of jaw-dropping silence, my jaw, not his, followed by some unlawyerly-like stuttering before I managed to get out my real reaction, which was, but what do you want me to talk about? Now, in my head, I had a whirlwind going on. Not the good kind of whirlwind in which unbridled creativity meets up with sharply honed analysis and produces that golden solution to everything. No, my whirlwind was more on the order of a mile-wide tornado bearing down on me at 100 miles an hour and leaving a swath of devastated nothingness behind it. What if he wanted me to talk about issues, political or otherwise? You know, the big stuff, separation of powers, the state of the law, the imminent destruction of the attorney-client privilege, taxes. What if he wanted me to talk about that? If you, if you had seen me in that moment, if you had seen me then, I probably would have looked like a deer in the headlights. And that, by the way, is something I've tried very hard not to look like in court. <laughs> I have to confess I must have conveyed a little of my inner turmoil over the phone because President LeDuc chuckled. It was soft, but there was a chuckle before he finally said, well, how about your journey? My journey. Okay, I can do that. I mean, what litigator worth his or her salt can't stand up and talk about something that ought to be near to dear in, to themselves, themselves? Of course, he capped me at 20 minutes. That was kind of a problem. But don't worry, I'm not going to give you a recitation of my cases, nor am I going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow of what it's like to work for a prestigious law firm on a daily basis. That, by the way, may be saved for the book and the movie in the future, but no spoilers here today. Okay, I had to boil it down. I had to boil it down. My journey, I thought, my journey is really quite simple. 30 years ago, I sat where our graduates are sitting today, on the cusp of the rest of their lives. Today, I'm somewhere I never expected to be, doing something I never expected to do. I'm on this stage addressing you here and now. In between, I think, I hope, I learned a few things. Things that helped me, some things that hurt me, some things that I wouldn't change for the world, some things I really wish I could do over. You know the old Frank Sinatra song, regrets I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention? Well, I'm like Frank, I'm not gonna mention my regrets. But what I am gonna talk about are a few things that I hope may help you in the long run. Pride, openness, engagement, and hope. Let me, talk, let me say that again, pride, openness, engagement, and hope. Now I gotta tell you, I tried long and hard to reorganize that so it would be, I don't mean hope, I mean honor. I wanted it to be honor, openness, pride, and engagement because that would spell hope. That's where it was coming from in my head. But honor is too important to talk about first. I have to save that to last. So I'm jumbling this up a little bit. Let me start with pride. Be proud of yourselves. This is a day to celebrate your accomplishments. Today is the culmination of years of hard work, perseverance, and sometimes downright grit and determination. Many of you started with a dream of becoming a lawyer. All of you started with that goal. 
Many of you came to law as a second or even third career. All of you will leave here today with the right to use JD behind your name. You've earned that title. Take pride in it and take pride in yourselves. And take pride in your school, too. I know, I know, we all know Cooley has taken a beating in the press lately. And we all know that the ABA has once again leveled an attack at Cooley's open enrollment and flexible schedules policy. I say, don't flinch from that criticism. Rise to meet it. Open enrollment and relaxed schedules are the reasons that so many people so many students do have an opportunity to go to law school, particularly non-traditional students, those who are parents, those who work full-time, those who have engaged in other careers before they came to law school, those who might even have a little gray hair. Those students bring a wealth of experience and diversity of thought, not only to Cooley, but to the practice of law overall. Now, I did a little research with Cooley's own Paul Zelensky and discovered that many of you exemplify my point. Among our graduates today, and by the way, I'm going to ask you to stand when I name your prior profession. Among our graduates today, we have former paralegals. Where are you? Stand up. Where are you? I know you're out there. There you are. See, I knew they were out there. Remain standing, OK? We have school principals. Where are you? You can't be shy if you're going to be a lawyer. We have teachers. We have members of the military. Let's rise up, folks. That's what we as lawyers do, rise to meet the occasion. Baristas, librarians, realtors, grant writers, state employees, bankers, Come on, folks, stand up. I know you're out there. See, I have to keep pushing them a little bit, but I know they'll do it if I asked. Court assistants, police officers, game developers, and college graduates, of course. Now, that means everybody ought to be standing, OK? Up you go. Up you go. And we even have one professional hockey player. Where's my hockey player? There. You're not my hockey player? Where's my hockey player? There we are, right over there. You all deserve that hand for having the courage to undertake this journey. Now you can be seated again, because I want to tell you, you also range in age from 28, excuse me, from 24 to 58, and you represent 22 states and three countries other than the U.S. Why does this matter? What is it the critics and the ABA fail to recognize when they complain about open admissions or point to the fact that many who are admitted never make it to a day like today? I think they're missing a couple of things. First, admission to law school is not and should not be a guarantee that you'll get a degree. You know that. Look around you. Not everyone who started with uh, law school with you made it through. Cooley may open the door to a law degree much more broadly than other institutions, but getting into law school and getting through it are two different prop propositions. Whether any student gets a degree depends almost entirely on that student, him or herself. You have to put in the work. You have to master a legal analysis, which at its core is a new way of thinking. Certainly, Cooley provides excellent professors and instruction. I don't think anyone would ever quibble with that. And certainly, its curriculum is on a par with any other law school. In fact, I'd argue, with respect, that Cooley's practical clinical-based classes surpass the offerings of any other law school in this state. How many of you here took one or more of the clinical classes? The elder clinic, access to justice? Well, you know what I'm talking about. You know how valuable that is, to not be walking into the practice of law not having a clue of what that means. And when you do the clinics, you know what that is. Cooley excels in that area. Yes, some folks will wash out. 
Some folks will decide that law school isn't for them. It certainly isn't for the faint of heart. And some won't pass the bar the first go round. But that's true of every law school in this country. Nonetheless, our critics want to focus on those who fail. I think they should look to our successes instead. We proudly count among our alums not only thousands of lawyers across the country, and indeed across the globe. Our alums include federal and state court judges, state legislators, state bar leaders, corporate executives, members of Congress, and even a governor. Today, you are about to join Cooley's success story. And I hope you will stand up for your school as you take your place in that story. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, I think our critics fail to appreciate the value of, and indeed the necessity for, diversity of thought and experience. The practice of law in the 21st century is very different than it was in the 20th century, way back when I graduated. We don't live in a cookie cutter world anymore. Now I admit, when I graduated, and again, back before the light bulb, keep that in mind. Okay, when I graduated, there was a mold into which you were expected to fit if you were going to succeed as a lawyer. Back then, all lawyers wore suits and ties. They joined the party and the clubs that they were told to join. They played golf. And if you didn't do all of that, you were probably a woman. Now, all kidding aside, if you did not fit the mold, your path to success was a much tougher road. Cooley's critics, I think, are trapped in the 20th century. They still believe in that mold, that all lawyers are and should be fungible, that we should represent one type of, excuse me, of individual, one way of thinking. Yet their allegiance of studies to show that bringing different perspectives, different experiences, different backgrounds to a problem results in far better solutions in the long run. Let me put it another way. If you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, all the pieces have to fit together, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, right yeah. Okay, I would hope so, you know. <laughs> You have to connect pieces of the puzzle that are different shapes, different sizes, different colors, different designs to make the whole picture. And you're able to interlock those pieces because they aren't all the same shape and the same, same size. Just think what would happen if all the pieces were square. The, the puzzle would never stay together, at least not for long. To be durable, the pieces have to be diverse. Now, diversity of thought is what you represent. Diversity of experience is what you bring to the practice of law. The jigsaw puzzle of that system we call justice will be all the stronger for it. And Cooley's approach has made that possible. So take pride in your school. Remember who made it possible for you to go to the dance. Okay, I'm done with pride. I want to talk about openness now, all right? It's really, really easy to get set in our ways, to hang with people we know, stay in our comfort zone, stay safe. Well, did you know that we're evolutionarily programmed to stay with people who look like ourselves? It's true. 200,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens first emerged back in the hunter-gatherer times, we formed tribes for safety, small groups of, of families that stuck together, hunted together for safety. And when somebody not of the tribe approached, it was kind of frowned upon to go up and say, hi, how you doing? Because that could get you killed. And if you were killed, you certainly weren't going to contribute to the further population of the earth. That test was left to the people who'd been cautious enough to stay away from the strangers to begin with. So they stayed back with their own kind. And some traits were weeded out, and some traits were selected for. You see where I'm going with this? I like to think we've progressed from our hunter-gatherer roots, though there's no doubt it still feels a lot easier to stay within our established groups. But let me suggest this to you. Stay open to new and different people. 
People who differ in age, in gender, gender identity, race, religion, nationality, pick a difference, there are so many. If you stay open to new and different people, I think you'll find some remarkable things. Among others, I think you'll find, you may well find that you have common ground, a common cause, or even a common reason for celebration. How many of you saw the wedding between Prince Harry and Mary, Meghan Markle yesterday? I confess I did, okay? I got up at 5.30 with the, and tuned in with the rest of the estimated two billion people who watched that on TV. I did the same, admittedly, for Diana and Charles and for William and Kate. I'm, I'm a junkie, I admit it. So I know what those royal extravaganzas have looked like over the past 30 years. But yesterday's ceremony struck me as very different. Yes, there was the traditional big church, the magnificent choir, and the big hats. But there was also a very intentional blending of cultures. Did you see it? Did you notice it? It wasn't just the guests who streamed in, though that was a starting point. And yes, the Gar Archbishop of Canterbury still presided, white dude, fancy robes, great and proper speaker. But the key address, the homily, was given by the head of the American Episcopal Church, who was not only American, he was African American. And his style of delivery was far more enthusiastic, far more enthusiastic than any other royal wedding had ever experienced. And along with the traditional boys and men's choir who gave exquisite renderings of the traditional hymns for the service, there was a black choir who gave an equally fantastic rendition of Stand By Me. And if that weren't enough, there was an exceptional young British man, also black, who's going to be a rock star following his performance on the cello. Now we know that Meghan Markle is biracial, so what's my point? Why am I bringing this up at your commencement ceremony? This was an intentional blending of the traditions of British royalty with American culture to cross racial and national divides. I told you two billion people tuned into that ceremony. Social media blew up over that event. And the royal family, which many have looked at as an anachronism that ought to be allowed to die out, they're in one hour strengthened itself tenfold on a global basis simply by embracing people who were new and different from themselves. I said before that you bring diversity of thought and experience to the practice of law, and thereby you will strengthen it. My point is that new and different people may very well strengthen you. Stay open to them. And stay open to the unexpected. You never know what's in store, and I'm going to get rid of this right now. <laughs> little, little strange to have that flipping in my, the back of my head. You really never know what's, what's in store for you. 30 years ago, before that, before I even went to law school, I thought I was gonna be a prosecutor. That's what I wanted. That's what I thought I was best suited for. That's why I took the trial skills class and joined the trial team. I wanted to serve justice, and to me that meant putting bad guys behind bars. Now I confess that my view was shaped to some degree by what I saw in the movies and on TV. There were good guys, and there were bad guys. The bad guys were always criminals, and the good guys were always the cops and DAs who got them off the street, maybe with the exception of Perry Mason. In any event, it was a much simpler time. So I wanted to be one of the good guys. I never, never saw myself working for a silk stocking law firm. I was gonna walk a straight line right into the Kent County Prosecutor's Office and start doing what I thought I was meant to do. But fate intervened, again, thanks to Cooley. Two Cooley students who were a year ahead of me went to Varnum as litigators. And in my last year in school, they recruited me to work there during the year as a clerk. I have to tell you that when they suggested it, I thought they were crazy. 
They knew that I wanted to be a prosecutor. I would never fit in with those corporate types, types much less enjoy the work. But to be honest, clerking was lucrative. And it helped me pay for my last year of law school. So why not? To my utter shock and amazement, I discovered that civil, civil litigation was as interesting and rewarding as I always thought criminal law would be. I never anticipated what it would feel like to help a three-year-old girl who'd been maimed by a lawnmower for lack of an available safety device, or to change the industry so that that safety device became standard on riding lawnmowers. I never imagined that I would be on the forefront of the legal issues presented by the advent of HIV and AIDS, or that I would get to spearhead the campaign for diversity and inclusion in my firm and in my community. I never expected to lead an organization of the caliber of the Grand Rapids Bar Association. And as I said before, I had no idea that I'd end up on this stage today. But I got those opportunities because my classmates, my friends, opened one specific and very unexpected door for me, and I chose to walk through it. My point is, you never know what tomorrow's going to bring. You may think you know where you're going, you may even be right, but be open to the possibilities and to the people that life presents to you. Then when you look back 30 years from now, you may find that your path was not a straight line either. You may find that it was an intricate voyage that led you to lands that you never thought you would see and that you were so happy you found. That being said, be engaged in your own destiny. It's your life, it's your command. Whatever you do with your future, be prepared to own it. Nobody owes you anything, not a job, not an income, not an opportunity, not a. You have to earn those things, and you have to do it on a daily basis. You've earned your degree. You know what it's like to engage in hard work. Now it's, in time, to, now it's time to engage in a whole other level, in the practice of law and in the practice of life. What do I mean? I mean you should engage in your community. Join a nonprofit board, volunteer with the Red Cross or the Cancer Society or United Way. Make time to do a little good. Doing good and doing well are not mutually exclusive, but even if they were, we as lawyers are duty bound to give back to our communities through pro bono service. Did you know that once you pass the bar and are admitted to practice, at least here in Michigan, you will take an oath of office administered by state and federal judges. And that state oath contains a promise that you will never, never reject the cause of the defenseless or the oppressed based on personal considerations for yourself, even if they can't pay. Why is this in the oath? Why is this so important? Because pro bono service is fundamental to keeping the doors to the courthouse open for everybody, not just for those who can afford to be there. Keeping those doors open, that's our responsibility, folks. That comes with the right to practice law. Now, I know, I know, the practice of law is a business. And you have the right to employ your new skills and your hard-earned degree to make a comfortable living. But in my view, pro bono service is the very thing that lifts the practice of law from the level of a mere business to the level of a profession. It keeps our system of justice alive for those who need it most. And I can tell you from my own experience, the cases that have meant the most to me the ones that I have der derived the most satisfaction from, the ones that remind me why I went to law school to begin with. Those are all cases that I took on a pro bono basis. Giving back is one of the most satisfying things you can do for yourself and your community. 
And now you have the skills to do it in a way that nobody else can. And that brings me to honor. I said I wanted to talk about honor last because it's so important. I meant that. It is. And I'm going to come at this from what may seem like a fairly domestic viewpoint, so I hope you'll bear with me. I was brought up in the Episcopal Church, and Episcopalians like to send their, their kids to Sunday school at a very early age, at a very young age. You got to learn about Jesus in the church, and not surprisingly, the Ten Commandments. And when you're young, the Sunday school teachers like to focus on one, on one commandment in particular. Guess which one? Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, I was a pretty serious kid. And I took what I was taught in Sunday school with, the, with all the gravity that a seven-year-old can muster. And I remember having dinner with my parents and telling them about what we learned in church that day. And I asked them what that commandment meant to them. What did I need to do to honor them? I can tell you I really didn't want to get in trouble with God. But I really didn't know what honoring my parents entailed. I mean, I knew about Father's Day and Mother's Day, but I was pretty sure the commandment went beyond that. So I asked them, what do I have to do to honor you? My father, bless his heart, who was generally religious only on Christmas and Easter, looked up from his dinner and said, it means you don't talk back. My mother, who was the real churchgoer in our house, said, it means you never lie to us. You make it so we can trust you. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. When you give me your word, I want to know that you mean it and that I can rely on it. You don't weasel. Now, that was a pretty good foundational building block for me. I admit that there were times when I was sorely tempted to weasel a little bit with the truth, particularly when I was a teenager. But as a tenant for a kid, it worked pretty well. As lawyers, honor is not just a building block. It is the bedrock of our profession. We are the keepers of the law, the guardians of the rules that allow society to function and even to exist. And that not only means that we must play by the rules ourselves, we must conduct ourselves in a way that generates trust. Why? So that when we give our word, our opinion, our advice, it can be relied upon. From a purely commercial standpoint, that's what we get paid for, advice. So it better be good. From a more practical standpoint, your reputation is your single greatest asset. Let me say that again. Your reputation is your single greatest asset. With your clients, with your colleagues, with judges and an opposing counsel, when you earn their respect, they will trust you, they will listen to you, and they will act accordingly. To earn their respect, you have to do more than show how skillful you are. You have to demonstrate honor. Or as my mother said, you have to make it so that I can trust you. When you give your word, I want to know you meant it. Your reputation, your honor, is something you will spend every day of your professional life building. And here's a warning. While that is the work of, an, of a lifetime, it only takes an instant to destroy it. So guard your honor carefully. Now there's another part of this honor equation. It's the golden rule. We all know that one, right? Treat others as you wish to be treated yourself. That's pretty standard stuff. So why bring it up now? Because I'm going to suggest to you that you treat your opponents as you would want them to treat you. Certainly, you are going to be zealous in the rep representation of your client. And I'm not suggesting that you treat the other side with kid gloves. I'm talking about respect. Opposing counsel may be your adversary, but adversary does not necessarily mean enemy. 
Why is this important? Look around, folks. What do we see on the news every night? What do we hear on the radio when we drive into work in the morning? Stories about polarization, about the extreme views of our politicians, about the divisions in our country, and even in our neighborhoods, divides that seem more and more impossible to bridge with every passing day. As attorneys, we have the skills, the knowledge, and I would say the responsibility to diffuse the runaway polarization that seems to be taking over so many aspects of our lives. We are trained as problem solvers. We are trained to look at both sides of a dispute and an issue. We are trained as peacemakers. That's what settlements are all about. To do our job effectively, I would tell you, we cannot look at those on the other side of the aisle, the courtroom, or the table, and simply dismiss them as the enemy. The practice of law is not and should not become a zero-sum game. I win, you lose. It's about finding solutions to problems. And that takes time and discussion and patience and respect. Yes. Sometimes you do have to go to war, but war is expensive for everyone, emotionally and monetarily. If you treat your opposing counsel as an adversary rather than as an enemy, you may be able to avoid the scorched earth of a trial, and in doing so, save all involved a great deal. And this is where honor and reputation come in. If the lawyer across the table knows you are a person of your word, knows you will do what you said you would do, and respects you for both your skills and your reliability, that lawyer is far more likely to deal and deal fairly with you and your client. And if you treat that lawyer and his client as you would want to be treated yourself, you will not only drive the boat towards the heavenly shores of dispute resolution, you may actually make a future ally in the process. FDR said, confidence thrives on honesty, on honor, on the sacredness of obligations, on faithful protections, and on unselfish performance. Without these, it cannot live. He was talking about confidence, but he might as well have applied these words to the practice of law. In my humble opinion, it is not an overstatement to say that without honor, we as lawyers cannot live. Now, I confess that when President LeDuc asked me to speak today, and after I got over that shock that I told you about, my first stop was the internet. I wanted to look up what other people had done for commencement addresses. Why are you looking at me like I'm a lawyer? I, I look for precedent, right? And almost everything I found talked about life is short. Use your time wisely. Follow your own path. Make a difference. Despite my tone, I don't really disagree with those sentiments. They're really very apt for occasions like this. But the one I liked best came from a fellow named Branch Rickey. Isn't that a great name, Branch Rickey? Branch Rickey was an American baseball player and a sports ex executive. In fact, you probably recognized, many of you probably did recognize his name. He was best known for breaking up major, excuse me, for breaking Major League Baseball's color barrier by signing Jackie Robinson and later drafting Roberto Clemente. Mr. Rickey made this point. At the end of the day, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, at the end of the day, it isn't about the accolades you take with you. It's about the heritage you leave behind. 30 years from now, when you've collected your accolades, and you will collect accolades, what will you leave behind? Life may be finite, folks, but I have great hope, H-O-P-E, that the mark you leave will be infinite. Congratulations. <laughs>